welcome to the Newark Public Library's video channel and another in a series of presentations about Newark Public Library collections and resources. I'm Greg Guderian, Special Collections Associate, here to share one of Newark, New Jersey's many great stories, the Newark Eagles Professional Baseball Club, and how Newark Public Library is preserving that story for generations to come. First, a little history of the Eagles and the city they called home. Newark in the 1930s was a bustling place, an industrial and transportation hub of nearly half a million residents. If you lived in Newark in the 30s, you might work, go to school, worship, shop, and enjoy some of the finest entertainment in the world, all within just a few city blocks. But the 1930s were the era of the Great Depression, a time when jobs, money, and food were scarce. Everyone was affected by the hardships of those years. However, if you were a person of color, the hardships of the 30s were compounded by injustice and inequality. In prior decades, African Americans had migrated by the millions out of the southern states, looking for economic opportunity and freedom from racism. They left the fields and farms and small towns of the south for the industrial cities of the north, and Newark was one of those cities. Most of these black migrants found more opportunity here, but they didn't escape racism. The races were still largely separated in daily life, and when blacks found work, they often had to settle for menial jobs and lower pay. There were limits, too, on where African Americans could live. Many were confined to the poorest housing, with few opportunities to move from such homes to better ones elsewhere in the city. Still, Newark's African Americans found many ways to strengthen community ties, build institutions, and contribute to the fabric of their city. One of those ways was through the professional baseball team known as the Newark Eagles. Black professional players didn't suddenly appear the moment Jackie Robinson entered the major leagues. There's a long history of multiracial and all-black teams and leagues going back to the beginnings of baseball. Although by the early 20th century, segregation had become the rule in team sports, Baseball continued to flourish in African-American communities as a pastime, a profession, a spectator sport, and a business. The Newark Eagles were owned by Abe Manley and his wife, Effa Manley. Abe Manley had made a fortune running gambling and bootlegging operations in Camden, New Jersey. Effa worked in a hat shop in Harlem when they met in New York in 1932. They were married the following year. In 1934, Abe purchased a baseball franchise in the Negro National League. The team was the Brooklyn Eagles. After one season in Brooklyn, the Manleys merged the Eagles with an earlier Newark team and moved the franchise to New Jersey. Their home field was Rupert Stadium in Newark's East End. Of the players making up the Newark Eagles, some had New Jersey roots. Second baseman Dick C., for example, was born in West New York. Pitcher Don Newcomb was born in Madison, New Jersey, and grew up in Elizabeth. Before joining the Eagles at age 17, second baseman Larry Doby was a standout athlete at Patterson's Eastside High School. Young Monty Irvin was just as versatile, lettering in four sports at Orange High School. Others found their way to Newark from different parts of the country. First baseman Fran Matthews hailed from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Pitcher Leon Day grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Third baseman Ray Dandridge came out of Richmond, Virginia. Pitcher Max Manning's road to Newark started in Rome, Georgia. First baseman Mule Suttles came up from Alabama's coal mining country. Outfielder, then first baseman Lenny Pearson, was from Akron, Ohio, by way of East Orange, New Jersey. There was talented left-handed pitcher Jimmy Hill of Plant City, Florida, the silver thatched catcher Raleigh Bismacki from Eagle Pass, Texas on the banks of the Rio Grande, and shortstop Willie Wells, another Texan who plied his incredible skills both sides of the border. The Mexican fans affectionately named him El Diablo, the Devil. These are just some of the men who shaped the history of black baseball and of baseball period. Some were young enough to follow Jackie Robinson and have careers in the major leagues. A few who never had the opportunity to enter the majors are nevertheless ranked among the greatest players of all time. Seven former Eagles were eventually inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame, although not all of them received that honor in their lifetimes. 
but more than any man who ever stepped onto the field in an Eagles uniform, the greatest impact on baseball and beyond was that of Effa Manley. With the Eagles, Newark had the distinction of being the only club owned and operated by a woman. While Abe Manley spent much of the year with the team barnstorming around the country to make extra money, keep his players in shape, and recruit new ones, Effa took care of the essential details from the Newark office. But she also understood the sport. She knew her players and spoke up about things that affected their success on the field. She dealt with fellow owners on an equal footing. Effa Manley loved baseball, but was a no-nonsense businesswoman who could hold her own against any man. Everything came together for the Eagles in 1946, when they defeated the Kansas City Monarchs in the seventh and final game of the Negro World Series. For the first and only time, the Newark Eagles could claim the title of World Series champions. But 1946 was also the sunset year for Negro League Baseball. The following spring, Jackie Robinson took the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers and signaled the end of segregation in the major leagues. For Effa Manley, the moment was bittersweet. Effa knew that many of her players were as good as or better than any white major leaguer, deserving the chance to be paid and treated on a level with whites, playing the game they loved. And she was proven right, as she started to lose them to the major leagues, beginning with Larry Doby. In the Eagles' 1946 championship season, Doby scored 41 runs in 43 games. He would go on to join the Cleveland Indians as the first African-American player in the American League, and the first to play in a World Series in 1948. Now, Effa did not think Negro League owners should give up their top players without compensation for having found them and brought them to a high level of play. For Larry Doby, the Manleys were paid $15,000 which seems like nothing in professional baseball terms today, but it was one of the first acknowledgments from society at large of the institution of Negro League Baseball and what it had achieved. It is very much because of Ethel Manley that black baseball has begun to receive the attention and respect it deserves. And in recognition of her role, Ethel Louise Manley was posthumously inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 2006 the only woman ever to be so honored. The Manleys sold the Eagles franchise in 1948. Abe Manley died in 1952. Three years later, Effa sold her home at 71 Crawford Street and moved away from Newark for good. But when she did, she left a buried treasure behind. In the basement of that Crawford Street address were 12 years worth of correspondence and business papers of the Newark Eagles. More than 40 years after the Eagles had last played, the papers appeared to be largely undisturbed. They were donated to the Newark Public Library, where they are preserved at the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center. Through the generosity of the Carnegie Foundation, the Eagles papers were recently digitized and put online. There are tens of thousands of items in the collection documenting the operations of the Eagles Ball Club under the guidance of Effa and Abe Manley. Most show Effa Manley running the team's day-to-day -day affairs, from negotiating player contracts to making deals with booking agents and other owners, from scheduling games to handling details of the player's physical health, their clothing and equipment needs, and even their family and personal challenges. Through the Eagles papers, one can also trace the history of the league in which the Eagles played, including some of the larger-than-life fellow owners and rivals of the Manleys. The league's founder, Gus Greenlee, Eddie Gottlieb, owner of the Philadelphia Stars, Alex Pompez of the New York Cubans, and Cum Posey of the Homestead Grays. The papers also reveal a fascinating world beyond baseball, since the Negro Leagues were part of a network of African-American business people and civic leaders all over the United States. Negro League games were important social events for all, from the black elite who turned up on Sunday afternoons in their finery to the laborers who crowded into the grandstands to enjoy a few hours free of toil. 
free of racism. The athletes on the field representing them, reflecting them back to themselves as people of worth and full of promise. The leagues were also a business that people in and out of the baseball world depended on, from powerful executives to the hot dog vendors, to the youngsters hawking newspapers on street corners. The status of the Newark Eagles in the black community was a source of pride. Effa Manley put that pride to good use, from organizing a benefit game, raising badly needed funds for Newark's community hospital, to allowing the NAACP to collect donations at season openers. She organized a baseball team for boys ages 12 to 15 called the Newark Cubs. Here's an example of the agreement she had the boys sign, promising to turn up promptly for practice, act in a sportsmanlike manner, and keep their uniforms clean. The Grand Hotel on West Market Street was the team's unofficial headquarters, and the hotel's bar and grill their after-hours hangout. Here, the Manleys met and entertained out-of-town guests, and the Eagles players and their opponents socialized with the fans. Effa Manley understood the importance of promotion and putting on a good show. Pioneer announcer Jocko Maxwell called the Eagles games and promoted them on his radio program. Effa made sure the black newspapers, including the New Jersey Afro-American and the Herald News, reported on the Eagles and the rest of the Negro League, and she wrote to let them know when she believed their coverage was inaccurate or fell short. PFC, the CPL, the SGT, the LT, CP, the OD, the MP, makes you do cappy, it's a GI giant. World War II brought a whole new set of problems for the Manleys. Attendance fell. Night games couldn't be played. Rationing made it all but impossible to take the team on the road, which they had to do to break even. A greater hardship was the fact that most of the Eagles' star players were called into military service. Several were stationed overseas and missed entire seasons. Here is a copy of a letter Effa sent to Biz Mackey, talking about wartime conditions. At one point, she writes, we have lost more good men than any team. And yet, with determination and patriotism, the Eagles played on. Another challenge of great significance for baseball's future was that Latin American leagues were forever courting the best Negro League players. Eagles stars could earn more money in Cuba or Mexico, Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic, Panama or Venezuela, and their money went much farther than in the States. The Latin leagues gave them an opportunity to play year-round to keep their skills sharp in the Negro Leagues off-season. Here is Eagles first baseman Lenny Pearson in the uniform of the Havana Ball Club for which he played four winters. Effa Manley didn't take kindly to players jumping to other teams or other leagues. She and Abe went to great lengths to prevent it and got their fellow owners to ban so-called outlaws from playing in the Negro National League for five years. But the attractions of Latin America, even apart from the money and the warm weather, were undeniable. The fans there were crazy for baseball. In fact, the African-American presence and style of play would have a tremendous impact on the sport in the Caribbean, Venezuela, and Panama, which would eventually transform the major leagues here in the U.S. More important to the players themselves was the freedom they experienced in Latin America, something they could not foresee ever enjoying back in the States. In Mexico, Cuba, and other countries, race was not a barrier. Even though they rarely spoke Spanish and most didn't care much for the food, for the first time in their lives, they felt fully respected as human beings. Maybe shortstop Willie Wells said it best in this interview from Veracruz, Mexico, where he admitted he made much more money than what the Manleys could afford to pay. El Diablo went on to say, I've found freedom and democracy here, something I never found in the United States. Here in Mexico, I can go as far in baseball as I'm capable of going. I can live where I please and will encounter no restrictions of any kind because of my race. Here in Mexico, I am a man.
While it's true that just a few years after the Wells interview, black players began to enter the major leagues, progress was slow. It would take a generation for a ban on discrimination in public places or employment to become the law of the land. And the journey isn't over. Still today, the nation seems to fall short in living out the true meaning of its creed, the humanity of all people. The Eagles papers help tell the story of that journey, a vital chapter of the struggle for civil rights through sports. You can search or browse the Newark Eagles papers from anywhere by using Newark Public Library's digital archive. Go to npl.org and look for the digital archive under the Collections tab, or go directly to digital.npl.org. In addition, Newark Public Library has an outstanding selection of books on baseball history, Effa Manley, and the Eagles for readers of all ages. Browse our online catalog at catalog.npl.org. If you have a question about this or any New Jersey topic, email us at njreference at npl.org. Thanks for watching, and wherever you're watching, thank you for patronizing and supporting your local public library. Check back frequently for more online programming from the Newark Public Library.